Can I ask if anyone in the audience, I think what Alan and Chris have talked about is um, how it affects, how it alters your life, how it's there constantly, the embarrassment, how it limits your ability to work, but also some of the things that have helped. Is there anybody in the audience who can add to that? I'm really interested in, oh, look, lots. I'm coming around. Here we go. Hello. <laughs> um, my name's Stephen, and um, I have um, blepharospasms, and I have uh, mage, which affects my voice, which you probably wouldn't realise. But there was a period when I could barely speak, and I could certainly not see without the help of my partner to guide me. And I take a very active role in life, and uh, I run a business still, and uh, lots of things that we all have to do, which suddenly were impossible. But I have found a couple of things that have helped. One is being under slight stress, which I am now. None of us like public speaking. I'm not really enjoying it, but I'm just pretending I'm... I'm actually projecting and hope, hoping that I'm helping because I believe that in a situation where you are slightly stressed or doing vigorous exercise, such as dancing... I, I ice dance, which is quite vigorous, but I also run for the bus, and I know that that helps... Now, is there something going on here? Is there some relationship between our ability to breathe properly and helping this condition temporarily? Or is there an inverse that if, it, if you can't breathe properly, it gets worse? Now, I'm not going to wear it today, but I do have a, a, a device that I use to stop myself snoring, or is to help, as my partner will agree it doesn't. But it helps me breathe. And when I put this little device into my nostrils, which I'm not going to do now, but what I do, it helps me breathe enormously. And occasionally in the office, if there's nobody else aware, around, I put this in, and it looks horrible, but it works. So is there a relationship between our problem of blepharospasm, and in my case, a bit further, the lady just now mentioned the neck. I've had um, Botox in the neck and in the uh, jaw, and it does help. Believe you me, you'd have thought you were talking to a Martian about two years ago when my voice was at its... Awful. <laughs> Unrecognisable. OK, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. That's well, that's well worth a clap. Thank you so much for expressing that. And I think those are the questions that certainly the four people I've been working with wanted to ask the um, professor, the pro blefos. And it's something that the pro blefos need to think about and maybe start to give us answers about. And it's something that they've expressed as well. Um, I just wanted to briefly raise something that's been an issue for me since I was diagnosed with blepharospasm, which is that I was diagnosed within six months of my 50th birthday. And almost all the contact I had with people um, after that time, um, either via the Dystonia Forum or people I've met, had been older than me at the time of diagnosis and have talked about how they struggled on for a little while and then decided to retire. Well, I was 50. Um, I was separating from my husband and had a young teenager. So for me, retiring hasn't really been an option. And working and continuing to sort of be stable enough to work has been very challenging, very exhausting, and actually only really possible because I've had um, supportive managers who sort of bent over backwards to help me. And, and I've, you know, I've found it very difficult to kind of a network with people who are sort of just trying to carry on with their everyday, day-to-day -day life and responsibilities, um, you know, at this kind of age, really. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about, just say briefly in terms of tricks, is that the only way I'm able to watch the television is that I sew. And I think it does two things. I think, first of all, I actually enjoy it and I find it very calming, which I think helps me and my symptoms. But of course, also what it means is I'm concentrating on my sewing and I'm only actually glancing up at the television from time to time. I'm not actually trying to watch that moving screen. And if I hadn't been able to do that, and if I didn't enjoy sewing so much, actually it would be, I don't know what I'd do, I'd probably have had to give up the TV. Um, so that's my trick that really helps me and means that I can still enjoy, enjoy television and films.
Thank you so much for that. I think other people have talked about sewing as well. Can I just check? Because I think there is a myth that blepharospasm only happens to the over 60s. So I absolutely recognize what you're saying. And I think that we need to think about that as well, because I do think that most people assume that it's a condition of older age. And it does impact far more if you're still, if you have young children, you still need to work, you've got no chance of being able to retire. And the financial situation, as people have said, if they're single, they don't know what they would have done. So I think it really is a life-altering, life-changing condition, and we really do need to tackle it. I think the two things that, for me, that have come out of uh, talking to the other blefos, three out of four of them have hearing loss. Is that common? Put your hands up if you have hearing loss. So quite a few of you. I mean, I don't know whether that's related or not, but it just struck me that three of, four of the four panellists have hearing problems. Uh, the other thing that struck me is, again, the lack of understanding about the condition, but also the problems when trying to retire on the grounds of ill health and the kind of reverse discrimination, the fact that you can't retire because it'd be discriminating against the blind. What a complete and utter nonsense that is. And I don't know, how, put your hands up if you've had difficulty in getting your occupational health to understand what's going on. A few of you, because I think that that's a real problem around blepharospasm, that people just do not understand the, the total consequences to your daily life. So it really is over to you now. What did you take from those four experiences? What do you want to say and how do you want to move forward from here? And there's so many arms. I'll go at the first arm that came up back here. When I was diagnosed, the main trauma for me was that while I wasn't able to drive anymore, and um, I lost a significant independence and was very worried about how I was going to get to work. But a friend of mine told me about access to work. And I don't know any of you that know about it, but um, blepharospasm is one of the conditions that is on the list. And I only have to pay 25p per mile, which is public transport rate. And the Department of Work and Pensions pick up the rest of the cost for me to go to work. So I have a taxi come and pick me up in the morning um, and pick me up in the evening from work. And it costs between £900 and £1,000 a month to get me to work. And it usually costs me between 60 and 70 So it's well worth you applying. Thank you so much for that. Uh, is it at all possible for you to write that down and leave a note for us so we can distribute it amongst everybody? OK, over to you. Thank you. Um, I was diagnosed about two years ago, maybe a bit more, I suppose. Um, I was starting to suffer about six months before that. Um, and I think listening to all of your stories, and it's been amazing, actually, because I, it resonates with me so strongly. Um, and some of the things that have some people have mentioned in terms of getting the breathing right and mindfulness and um, the, the, the impact of stress and all of those things are things that I've been working on um, over the last year or so in trying to bring my condition under control, which I think um, I brought my husband along here today because he thinks I'm better. Um, <laughs> but he doesn't understand that actually when you look better, it doesn't mean you are better. And I think a lot of you will probably know what I mean when I say that. Um, but um, one of the things that I've been doing, I'm on a Facebook group and I came to meet them um, through going to see um, a chap who was in Spain, in Seville, but is now in, in Toronto, sadly, but um, a guy called um, um, Joaquin Farias, who um, has spent the last 20 years um, using neuroplasticity retraining to treat people with dystonia and had started doing some work with, with blepharospasm. And I went to see him, and I've seen him a few times since. Um, there is a Facebook group with all of his ex or clients, I suppose, um, patients and patients who would like to follow this approach. And there's lots and lots of tips on there. And then it's all about trying to reprogram ourselves and, and using, um, um, you know, stress reduction and mindfulness and, and getting a lot of sleep. Sleep is really important um, in terms of our recovery. And, and I think 
Um, I would be happy to share it with anybody what that Facebook group is if anybody's interested in, 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 in sort of learning a bit more about that. Um, but I think there's been a lot of those key aspects of, of how we can recover, um, you know, maybe not fully, but we talked about the cure, and I think the cure, a lot of the cure needs to come from us in terms of how we, how we change what we do. Um, and I was a completely manic person working 24-7, um, lifting very heavy weights, and um, you talked about exercise. Exercise does not help me, but Tai Chi and things like that do. And I think that comes back down to the breathing. Um, but I've had to change my life, and, and actually, I think probably for the better. You know, I now spend more time with my children and my husband instead of in front of a computer. Um, I'm still working, but um, yeah. So I just, I just wanted to share that, and I think there's a lot of important things that are coming, th uh, threads that are coming through here today, which, which I think can help us. Can I say thank you? Can I say thank you for that? And could I ask you to link up with Alan over lunch to give him that information so he can disseminate it to everybody? And could I say to your husband that as a part blefo, there's an awful lot of other part blefos here. Any part blefos want to put your hands up? That's a partner's friends and families. There you go. There's an awful lot of support around because I'm always aware, and certainly when I was diagnosed with my condition, friends and family members were the ones who struggled even harder because at least I was in the moment fighting the disease and doing battle and sorting out medications and going to see the consultant. And it's friends and family who are left completely in the dark, not knowing how to support, what to do, just wanting things to be all right and pretending things are all right. So I absolutely understand how partners feel in this process. So you might want to get together over lunch. We're starting here. We've got an awful lot of hands up, so this is exciting. Hello, uh, my name's Alison, or Ali for short. I just wanted to share that I've been exploring um, hyperbolic oxygen therapy. Um, went to that originally in early August because I was having scans because MS runs in the family. Um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in September last year, blepharospasm January this year. Um, and I know that the oxygen therapy is good for inflammation, so I went down the line of the RA. And I'm beginning to find that it has a, a positive effect um, temporarily. Um, I had my last treatment on Thursday um, of uh, oxygen therapy. I'm due my... Botox on the 2nd of December and I know it's wearing off and I can feel it's wearing off um, but on Monday, Tuesday this, this week I got my eyes taped up with little um, paper stitching tape because I was really struggling. I had the oxygen therapy on Thursday. Um, it's not cured, it's not gone but I'm not wearing the tape to keep my eyes open and I've come down from Leicestershire by bus and made it through the tube um, which I wouldn't have done on Monday or Tuesday. So it definitely has effect, whether it's a placebo one, whether it's an anti-inflammatory one, because they possibly have Schrogan's, I don't know. But I do think it's worth looking at uh, for those possibly. Um, if you're going to look at it and research it a bit, I would, you know, you, it, you'd have to probably not look at me because I have other conditions that are probably being helped by the oxygen therapy. I also use mindfulness a lot. Um, and my blepharospasm has been a gift in that I've discovered I can sketch. Thank you very much for that. It's, <laughs> it's so helpful when you share experiences. And interestingly enough, oxygen therapy has helped my condition a bit too. <laughs> Don't know why. And actually helped quite a few people with my condition. So again, if it's possible, if you could link up with Alan to give him that information over lunch and then he can disseminate it to you. Please give your email addresses to Alan so that we can stick together as a group of people around blepharospasm as a community to make sure that we move forward. Could I just ask a, a random question, please? It follows on from your question about how many people here have actually um, got hearing loss. And I was just wondering, for a show of hands on how many people actually have tinnitus of some description and whether that's of any significance at all. I think it's a really good question to ask and I think that these are, I mean, I, I note that the pro are taking notes here and I think that there is 
a large enough cohort of people experiencing both hearing loss and tinnitus to begin to question why that is. I mean, of course, it may be coincidental, but it does seem to me that it's too large a cohort for it to be coincidental. So I, th I think that will be tackled. I think we're going over there now. Hi, may I ask a quick question? My name is Veron. I was diagnosed with blepharospasm at age 43, and um, it took a year, a tw 12 months before I was diagnosed properly. But um, thankfully, I'm at the UCL where I'm being treated now with good results. However, have been, I have been having problems with my ear, seen my GP for the past six months, given various medications, but I still have that feeling of in my ear, you know, t it's something like tinnitus, like I'm falling, but they still can't, my GP just can't put place, they sent me to see a specialist, they still can't um, say what it is, various eardrop, the problem continues. So I'm sort of listening to everyone here, wondering if it has anything to do with my blepharospasm, because when I explain to the doctor that possibility, I do get spasms in my cheek area going around my ear, but they didn't seem to be concerned about that but now I'm listening to others it seems um there could be a connection anyone anyone of any um is is that um, something that the pro blefos can tackle or is it something that we need to be thinking about you've got an answer <laughs> uh, what I'm uh, uh, very interested is that we know that um, we say uh, one of my, my my patients say dystonia is like water doctor you stop it at one place and then it uh, goes somewhere else. And uh, we know that with the blepharospasm because it spread to the jaw, to the neck, to the larynx. And um, so I'm very interested with uh, hearing loss or if it's something which uh, spread around the inner ears, why not? But what I've been interested when I went to the group of uh, Katy Palmer that uh, somebody mentioned, Jane, I think, is that some patient mentions a... Uh, lack of balance, where the blepharospasm are full gears. When it's controlled with the Botox, it's fine. But, and they say, it's beyond having my eye closed. And the patients say, I can ride my bike when the Botox is working. And as soon as uh, 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 I feel the Botox is wearing off, I feel loss of balance, and I can't use my bike anymore. And the patients say, and it's not because my eyes shut, it's something like my balance is not good anymore. So I was very interested because you know that balance and earring is the same nerve, it's the eighth nerve, and it's all the same place. So anybody has a loss of balance more than the eye closed? Riding bicycle, who can ride his bicycle? People have difficulty with their bicycle. It's very interesting. I mean, I was just thinking out loud what, uh, when they were... I, I, I was not aware of the earring loss and the tinnitus. I've not heard that from my... I should have, they should have told me, but we don't hear everything, you know. Okay, I, th I think that really demonstrates the power of a group of blefos getting together, discussing their symptoms and letting the pro blefos know. So thank you very much for that. I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Any other comments here? I know you've been, you've had your hand up for ages. Yeah, my mum's been recommended to have Botox, but she's quite anxious, I think, around having injections around the eyes. So I wondered if the panel could share what it's actually like to, to have it. You know. It's probably one of the more painful things you'll ever have, but it is extremely short-lived. It is really short-lived. You know, as the needle is going in, it, it is painful, but it's such a very short injection with a, a, a tiny dose of stuff. So I, I use um, an Antop gel, which has been prescribed by Dr. Marion. Um, <laughs> she's my saviour. <laughs> Uh, because I found the injections very, very painful and I would be very, very anxious before the injections and I'd be literally shaking with fear because of the pain. Um, but once I started using Amtop gel, this, um, it's a gel, a cream, you just need a very minute amount. Um, just put on the eyes, uh, around the eyelids, where the injection sites are, about one hour before treatment and... It, was, it just completely changed um, everything and I can now have injections and I don't flinch um, and it's just amazing. So I, I really, really would recommend you ask your doctors if that would be um, 
possible. You also don't, don't actually need a prescription for it. You can, um, although I was prescribed it, um, I actually went to Boots and they said, oh, you don't need a prescription for this. Um, and it only cost me about two pounds. Um, and each tube, they're tiny little tubes, about five mils, but I get about three lots out of it per, for each, about three lots of injections. Um, but it really has changed um, my um, way of thinking of having Botox injections. Otherwise, I think I may have given up <laughs> long before. Could you just say again what it was called? I think there's lots of interest in that. It's what they put on children but before they have injections. Um, it's, it literally just numbs the skin. And um, it's called Amtop, A-M-T-O-P-E, Amtop Gel. And the other sort is uh, called Emla, E-M-L-A. Uh, they both work in the same way. Um, but they're used um, a lot in hospitals um, when people, children especially, don't like in having take blood being taken and they just apply it to the skin. Um, no side effects from it at all. And it wears off after about two to three hours. Thank you very much. And I think one of the things that we'll do is continue to share information and disseminate it. So if you give your email addresses to Alan over lunch. But remember, this is just the start of the dialogue. We've got a long way to go, but I think an awful lot has already come out this morning. And I want to thank certainly the four people who've so bravely stood up and told their stories, but all of you for participating in that. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.